Well, it's great to be with you again today, and it's exciting to be here, and I thank God for you and for your church, and and uh, we do continue to pray for Pastor Eric. I texted with him last night, and he did say he's been in a lot of pain, and continue to pray for him that, his, that the day would be even better. So let's begin with prayer today. God, we've prayed already, Lord, for Pastor Eric, but we pray for his healing. Lord, we just pray for his complete recovery. We release him today from pain and that he can start seeing a turnaround, Lord, from his surgery and that things will start going the way it should be expected. Thank you for his family, for Kristen and for this church. And Lord, we pray for also Randy and his family as the, their little baby has surgery. And Lord, we just pray that you just see this through in, in an effective way. Thank you for this church and for your love. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Brother Eric was speaking about a friend of mine, George Thomason, who uh, worked for the, uh, at the time was a pastor at the Northwood Baptist Church in West Palm Beach. And, and he and I were at college together and became friends together. We were fierce competitors when it came to bass fishing. And so we would uh, go out and we'd have tournaments organized in our association. And uh, some, sometimes his church would win the tournament and sometimes my church would win the tournament. But we had a great time together, and Brother George has stayed a friend for a long time. And it's kind of it's kind of interesting how lives intersect like this, you know. And I've known Brother Eric probably about 25 years, and uh, and uh, just uh, been able to to know him and to spend time with him, working on teams in our association over the years, and uh, and uh, having a part of uh, seeing this church get this property as being administrative lead at the association. And uh, it's, been, it's been a wonderful blessing. And so I'm thinking about it. It's moving up to almost two years that I have uh, retired. Uh, and I, lately I haven't thought about that because I've been pretty busy. And uh, I have two funerals to do this week. So I told my wife, I said, this is not supposed to be what retirement is supposed to be about. No, I'm having, but I'm having a great time. We saw in the video just a moment ago, uh, Yellowstone National Park. How many have ever been there? Yellowstone National Park. Now, you're the blessed ones, haven't you? Did you ever see Old Faithful? Did you see Old Faithful? Some of you did, okay? Some of you didn't see it. Now, I'm not talking about Jellystone. That was where Yogi Bear hung out, okay? But we're talking about Yellowstone. And I, and I was, as I was preparing and finding this video for this service, I was saying, I got to go there. I got to put that on my bucket list. I've never been there. You know, but if you know about a geyser, it's characterized as a natural spring. And it, you know, and, and it'll go up about 140, 180 foot tall. You know, and uh, see what in action, uh, people say it's just a breathtaking experience. And with most geysers, you don't know exactly when they'll erupt. But Old Faithful, you can count on it every 60 to 110 minutes, Old Faithful is going to erupt. And whether the park is open, whether the park is closed, whether or not they have lots of people there or no one is there, you know, no matter whether the Dow Jones is up or Dow Jones is down, it doesn't make any difference. No matter who is president, you know, that Old Faithful is going to do what it does best. And that's going to come up out of the ground and, and gush forth. You know, as we think about that, people find that kind of consistency remarkable. I find that consistency really remarkable when it comes to church. I love it when people I know are going to be counted on. One of the greatest things that you can think about as a pastor is that when you've got folks in your church that you can know every single week, they're going to be counted on. I remember growing up in church, and I grew up, and I, I cut my teeth on the pews. Okay, we had pews back then. And uh, my mother was the minister of music at many churches throughout the years. And uh, I remember um, growing up that, uh, uh, you know, there, there were always people that you could always count on being faithful. There was this one guy, they would give him a pin every year for faithful attendance in Sunday school. And I think his pins went down that far. I mean, it was, I mean, he, he was like dra dragging the ground almost because he was so faithful. And I had uh, people in other churches would, would be that way, but they would give them when they go on vacation, if they brought back a bulletin from the church that they uh, visited, then they could get counted as, you know, being faithful. And I had, no, no lie, I had several times people would come in to my church after the service was over and say, we drove by, but we need a bulletin. <laughs> I said, well, why is that? Because we want to let our pastor know that we were in church. I said, no, you weren't in church now, but I'll give you a bulletin anyway. You deal with that and you and God, okay? But uh, today, though, we're going to look at what it means to be consistent, what it means to be faithful. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture that highlights one of the fruit of the Spirit. 
Now, if you've ever studied it, I'm sure you have, the fruit of the Spirit, you know, you know that uh, love and joy and peace and gentleness and long-suffering and, you know, we can go on and self-control and all of those things. If you're a believer, then you are supposed to have all of the fruit. In other words, you can't pick and choose what fruit you want and which ones you don't want. You know, a day I want to be lovely, but I don't want to be gentle. No, you can't do that. You see, and that's another thing to think about the fruit of the Spirit, and I know this message is only on one of the fruit, is faithfulness, but people ask me sometimes, well, Pastor Ralph, how, how do I know I'm a Christian? How do I know I'm saved? How do I know I, you know, that I, that I just did, went through the motions, and, you know, sometimes I don't feel saved. You ever have those days when you don't feel saved? I have those days. I sometimes feel like God isn't any further than this when it comes to my prayer time, you know, where, but, you know, but the, the bottom line is, Number one, if you are wondering about your salvation, that's a good indication that you are saved because people who do not know Jesus don't wonder about their salvation. They don't go, well, I wonder if I'm saved. No, they don't do that. Only believers wonder about their salvation. Second of all, an indication that you're a believer is that you possess the fruit of the Spirit. And so if you're erupting with love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and faithfulness and all these things, you know, then realize that that's a good way to indicate that you have Jesus Christ in your life because you can't have the fruit of the Spirit if you don't have the Spirit. You know, people in the world have to manufacture that. You get it as a result of your relationship with God. Isn't that good news? You can say, man, it's all right. I, 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 know, I know we're not... Uh, Pentecostal here, but you know, you can go amen or praise the Lord or whatever you want to do there if you believe in that. God said so. But um, each fruit is unique. For example, joy is an emotion, you know, and, and uh, you can expect to experience it on a daily basis. There are things you can do, but that's not what the message is about. Peace can be considered kind of as an emotion as well. Kindness is an attitude that drives our, our interaction with others. Goodness has nothing to do with our feelings. But it's an action that is determined by a case-by-case -case basis. But faithfulness, we'll see today, is a unique gift, the fruit of the Spirit, that is characterized throughout our life. It is, a, it is something that we grow in our relationship with God throughout our life. And so it's something that, that we will understand that it's not a one-time done thing. Well, I was faithful in church. I, I went there and I got saved and that's it. No, faithfulness... Is something that we're about all of our life. You know, it's a day-in, day-out process of consistency. So I put a quote on the screen. Eugene Peterson defined faithfulness as a long obedience in the same direction. A long obedience in the same direction. So let's look at our text this morning. It's a little bit long. And uh, hang in there as we read it together out of Matthew 25. And, I, and it's going to be on the screen. It's going to be in your notes. And you can even open... A written copy of the word or open your phone or whatever you use to look at the word isn't it great today that you can have the word wherever you want it i just love you know i got my phone with me and anytime i want to go visit somebody and i can just pull it out of my pocket and you know pick out the scripture and have it right there you know it's just so wonderful we have more scripture available today in america than any other nation but we have less people reading the bible than anywhere else and that's sad now, think about it okay let's look at Matthew 25, 14. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver, and other versions say talents, to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. And after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I have earned Five more. In other words, he doubled the money. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibility. Let's celebrate together. 
Verse 22, the servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I know that you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant, if you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why did you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. And then he ordered, Take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver and to those... To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even from what little they have, will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant out into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. As we look at that scripture today, I want you to think about faithfulness in terms of God's faithfulness. I want you to think about how faithful God is to you, how faithful God is to me. First of all, he's faithful to himself, meaning that he never does anything that is inconsistent with his character. Look at Psalm 89.8. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Also, we know that he's faithful to himself, but he's also faithful to his word, meaning that he keeps his promises. The Lord is faithful to all of his promises and loving toward all that he has made. Any good news that God can't break a promise? He can't. You know, back in the year, we, we talked about, uh, you know, the flood today and Noah. And, you know, think about it. He said, I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky. I'll never do this again. So every time you go out there and you see a rainbow, remember that God's promised that he'll never flood the whole world again. So he, he keeps his promises. He cannot lie. He's God. He is perfect. He's holy. He has no sin. So think about God. When he says he's going to do something, he will do something. And when he tells us that you'll have eternal life when you die, if you receive Christ as your Savior, when you, when you repent of your sin and when you give your life over to Jesus and, and uh, you, you become his disciple, the Bible says he gives you eternal life. He doesn't lie. And so... Even those days you don't feel all that saved, all that wonderful about your relationship with God. I want you to know you still belong to him because he doesn't lie to you. By his grace, you have been saved. Isn't that good news? Oh, thank you for that. I didn't want you all to be back to sleep. This is early morning, isn't it? And uh, so listen to this verse out of uh, 1 Corinthians. He talks about he's faithful to his people. You know, he says uh, he, he'll take care of us. He'll watch over us. You see this again and again in Scripture. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who calls you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is what? Faithful. So when we get out of here today, you're going to hear that the word faithful has been used a lot of times. So when you walk out of here today, you don't remember anything else. And I know how sermons are like, OK, I've, it's done. And, and you're kind of thinking about what did I what, what did he talk about today? I hope one thing you'll remember is about faithfulness. So hold on to what that means today. We're going to look at it. So when we face temptation, God is faithful and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you could stand up under it. I love that scripture. How many of y'all been tempted this last week? All right. We all have, right? It might have been food. You might be on a diet and all of a sudden someone offers you this wonderful piece of pie. You go, oh, no, get behind me. No, no, no. What do you do? Sometimes you give in. And so, but we're not talking about that kind of temptation. He's talking about temptation to real sin, temptation to lust, temptation to greed, temptation to lie. Temptation to do ugly things to your neighbor when he does ugly things to you. You know, it's a temptation to lose your cool, you know, and all those things, you know. So when we think about that, when we are tempted, he gives us the power within our life. We're going to talk about that, the Holy Spirit power to give us a way to escape it, that we can stand up under it. Now, he's not talking 
about here that uh, that you cannot go through trials in your life. You know, you're going to all go through trials. You know, I heard people say years ago, well, God will never give me more than I can handle. Anybody ever heard that statement? Some of you may have even made that statement. God will never give you more than you can handle. And I said, that's, you know, that's not in the Bible. The Bible does not say that. You know, it does not say he won't give you more than you can handle. Pastor Eric's in the hospital, not because he's done something wrong, but because he lives in a fallen world that has all kinds of difficulties. We have bodies that are breaking down on a regular basis. You know, we, we are, that's why we look forward to the glorified body one day in heaven. So, you know, when you think about that, you know, that's one of the things the Bible did not say. So you could be a wonderful Christian and you can be faithful to God every single day. You can give your tithes. You can give your offerings. You can come to church. You can serve the Lord out in the community. You can sacrifice your life and still get trouble in your life. It's not because that God doesn't love you. God goes through those trials with you. I love that old footprint saying, you know, I only saw one, you know, one pair. We've all seen that one. And that's when, what, what happened there? And I said, that's when Jesus picked you up and carried you through. And that's what he has to do in our life. So, and I love it when we fail God, even when we fail him. And I don't know about you, I fail him on a regular basis. I've been a Christian since I was six years old, okay? I accepted Christ very early in my life. And so I, I do the math here. It's about 61 years I have been a Christian. And, and I want you to know, even though I felt like I've walked pretty close to God most of my life, there's been a lot of times I've failed God. And I always claim this scripture, 1 John 1, 9. Let's read that together. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a great verse? You confess your sins to God, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And that's good news, isn't it? I, I, you know, so when we're under attack, he's faithful. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. So when the evil one is attacking you and throwing all the darts that he can at you, and you feel like you're never going to make it through. The Lord says, I'm going to protect you from the evil one. I could go on and on, but it suffices to say that God calls us to be faithful because he is faithful. And that faithfulness is demonstrated to us again and again and again. And that's why we read in the book of Lamentations. That's, what, that's a verse we don't read about a whole lot. But in Lamentations 3.23, it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And from that is the great hymn that we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, was written. You know, this you can count on the sun to rise every single day. You can count on the faithfulness of God. You can know that He loves you every single day, even when you mess up, even when you fail Him. You can know that God's mercy and His steadfast love will be available to you every single day. So He is faithful, and He wants you to be faithful. He is faithful, and he wants you to be faithful. Now, some of you are saying, whoops, too late. <laughs> I'm not a very consistent person. Yeah, I'm not consistent in my character. I'm, I'm probably the most inconsistent person I know. And if faithfulness is one keeping one's promises, well, I've racked up many, many broken promises. You know, I, I remember when my little boy, uh, Mark, when he was about uh, maybe five or six years old, and I would come home from church that day from the office, and I'd come in the driveway and say, Daddy, 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 you know, can we go out and play ball? You know? And I said, well, give me a minute, you know. And, and, uh, and then he'll come back in and say, well, Daddy, you ready to play ball? And I said, well, can we play ball, you know, a little bit later? And I said, yeah, maybe. Well, next time he came back in, he said, well, Daddy, he says, you know, it's either yes or no, no maybes. <laughs> How many of you parents have been guilty of saying Maybe. We've all been guilty, haven't we? I still remember that. It's either yes or no, but no maybes. I'm tired of the maybes. And we're, a lot of us are like that, you know, that we're, we're not faithful in every area that we should be. And so we need to remember that it's important that to earn the title of a faithful servant. Remember, that's what the Jesus said to the, or, or the master said to the servants. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. If we want to earn that, it's not because, you know, we haven't messed up. We have. We haven't broken a promise. We have. But it is a faithful servant is an extended journey. 
you know, I want you to know the longer you become a believer, the easier it is to stay on that journey. It's hard when you start, first start out. But the longer you stay as a believer and practice the faithfulness that God gives you, you know, it is, it, it is a long obedience in the same direction. So today I want to talk to you about how to cultivate the quality of faithfulness. How to cultivate the quality of faithfulness. And we'll take a closer look at the parable that we read a little bit earlier. In this story, Jesus tells about a man who's ready to t head out of town. He's going on a journey, and so he calls his servants together, his three servants specifically, and he gives them money. You know, uh, he gives one five, and basically a, a talent was basically a, about $1,000. So he gives one $5,000, he gives one $2,000, he gives the other one $1,000 worth of silver, so to speak. And he gave them that money according to their ability. Now, that's something to think about. A lot of police people today in the churches today, a lot of Christians today, think that they're being judged according to someone else. Well, I'm not going to ever be a, a teacher like Rodney is, or I, I'm never going to be a singer. You know, I, you know, I, I'm not going to ever be able to be a person who has, you know, a, a ability to speak publicly. I, I can't do very much, and and I want you to know something. God doesn't judge you according to someone else's gifts and someone else's abilities, and someone else's, you know, opportunities. He's only judge you by what he places in your hand. Hold out your hands just a second. Look at your hands. And I want you to think about that. What does God place in your hands? What has he given you in your life? What, what have you have available? It may be money. It may be resources. It may be a good job. It may be all kinds of, uh, you, you might be good in math. I know the guy in my church, he does my taxes, and he still does it with pencil. I mean, this guy owned an a, a h and R block uh, up in New York, and so I go to him, and he, he just sits there and adds up all the figures, you know, just by, just like that. I'm going, let me get my calculator out, okay? Let's, I can do two and two and four and four and all that, but, you know, when it started getting a little bit deeper there, he's just like putting it all down. He has a wonderful gift in that area, so he should use his gifts for the kingdom, and he did. He was our treasure for a lot of years. You see, God never calls us to do things that are, are way away from our gift mix. I mean, if he does, he's going to give us the ability. There's, a, there's no doubt about that. You know, I, I had a guy I was in uh, college with, and I was a music minor in college, and, uh, and his name was John. Wonderful man. Man of integrity. And uh, he felt like that God was calling him to be a music minister. And he went to the Church of the Nazarene. And uh, so... Every day, John would sit by me, and we would do this thing. It was called sight singing ear training. And he would go over there, and he would, and the teacher, the professor would play, do, 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 and so write that down. So you'd have to write down the notes for that. You know, so you, you know, and so we'd write it all down. And every day, you'd get a grade. Well, every day, I'm not bragging, but I got pretty much all right. I had a pretty good ear to listen and understand the intervals and all that. But John failed every single day. And finally, throughout about a year of college, he realized that maybe God wasn't calling him in that area. You see, he doesn't call us up away from where we are gifted and naturally talented. So that's what he was doing with these servants. He was giving them according to their abilities. So as we think about that, a talent was a lot of money. I don't know about you, still $5,000 is a lot of money to me. Uh, not as much as it used to be and with this inflation thing going on, you know. Uh, and so I was so excited. I'm, I'm on Social Security now. I'm going, okay, I get 5.9%. Oh, well, because okay, inflation is 9%. So we're still losing money. All right. And then Medicare costs went up. Okay, so we won't go there. I won't, I won't blame anybody. Uh, okay. But uh, I don't want anybody to write me letters. So. Each servant, even to the last one, even the guy that got the $1,000, even the one that had the one bag of silver, was given quite a bit of capital to work with. I want you to think about that in your life. Remember I told you to look at your, your hands and think about what you have available to use? Whatever you say, well, I can barely lift it all. I've got so much available to me, or I can, I can barely see it. It's <laughs> but whatever it is that God has given you, you're, to, you're called 
to use that to his glory, whatever your ability are. You know, and, uh, you know, the, the, the guy with the five, you know, he turned it into ten. The master said, good job. You're faithful in this area. I'll give you even more. The servant was given two talents, to, you know, and he turned it into four. And the master said, good job. You know, well done. And I'll give you even more. And the servant was given one talent and said, Master, I was afraid of you. I was afraid that I would lose it, man. I was afraid that I would squander it. I was afraid that I would invest it wrongly. So we you know what I did? I dug a hole and I buried it in the ground. I want to keep it safe. It's kind of like the guy who keeps his money under his mattress, you know. So here's the money you gave me. Here, it's all there. You can have it back. We're even Stephen. He said, uh, we're not even Stephen. He said, what you should have done at least you could have done. If you didn't want to risk it anywhere, you should go and put it in the bank and let it earn, at least what we get today, a 1% interest, you know? And, and so he said, I'm going to take your talent and I'm going to give it to the one who has 10. And I'm going to cast you outside with his weeping and gnashing of teeth. A lot of lessons can be learned from this story. A lesson we'll focus on today is the quality of faithfulness. So wherever you fall on the faithfulness spectrum today, in this moment of time, I want you to know that you can begin taking steps, moving to the right direction, and moving closer to the finish line. The parable teaches us three ways to cultivate the quality of faithfulness. First of all, to become faithful, start today with what you have, even if it doesn't seem like much. Start today with what you have, even if it doesn't seem like much. You know, we have a tendency to think that we, uh, we don't have enough to work with. We often compare ourselves unfavorably as we look at others. Well, you know, I don't have what they have, or I don't have what they have. They got a better job, and they make $100,000 a year, and I make $25,000 a year, or whatever. And, and we hear all of these things, and we compare ourselves, and we look at their abundance, and we look at our meager amount. I actually read a survey not too long ago that talked about millionaires and about 70% of people who were millionaires, which really make up about one percentile of the basically the global wealth distribution, people who have a million dollars, about 1% of the global distribution of wealth, but they don't think they're wealthy. So you ask them, well, what is wealthy to you? They'll say, well, a minimum would be $5 million. You see, maybe that was the problem with a servant who only received the one talent. As I mentioned, in those days, a talent was a lot of money and a semi-fortune. You could do a lot with it. See, God never calls you to be faithful with what he has not given you. So, if he hasn't called you to teach and you don't have the ability to teach and you can't remember how to teach or however, it's just not your gift, he's not going to hold you accountable to that. But he's called you to be faithful to whatever he has given you. I had a gentleman in my church a number of years ago, and, uh, his, and I'll give you his name. His name's Carl. Wonderful man. He's worked with his hands. He can rebuild Airstream trailers and all these things. You know, he's a very talented guy. He came to me one day after he joined the church. He said, Pastor, I want to serve the Lord, but I don't know where I can serve him. He said, I only have a sixth grade education. He says, I can't read very much. I don't even want to go. I'm scared to go to Sunday school or Bible study because I don't, I'm afraid I'll get called on to read, you know. And he said, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I want to do something for the Lord, you know. So I said, well, Carl, I said, you know, you come on Sundays pretty early, I noticed. And I said, we need these envelopes in the back of our chairs stuffed, you know. And we would, we're, we're a church that had chairs like you, you guys. We have an auditorium there at O'Galley that... Uh, had, uh, you know, is, is a worship center, but it also is a gymnasium with basketball and volleyball and all that stuff. And, and, and uh, I said, we need all these 600 chairs stuffed with envelopes. Make sure they have envelopes in them. Now, that, that, he didn't have to do every single one, but he had to make sure the ones that were empty. So I said, if you could just come in and make sure to have a pen and an envelope every week, that'd be wonderful because we don't have people doing that. And our, our secretaries have to go out and do that, and they really don't have time to do that. And so he said, I'd love to do that. So every morning I'd get there, and the, and the band would be practicing, you know, and, and he'd be out there going row by row, putting those envelopes in. Now I want you to tell you something. 
God is going to bless him and reward him equally as much as he would reward me with the gifts that he's given me. There is no, like, like okay, I'm going to reward Pastor Ralph more because he's preaching the word. No, he's going to reward Carl just as much as he's going to reward me because he's using what he has for the Lord. Carl says, you know what, I got this pressure cleaner. And I, I see the walks are kind of getting kind of dirty out to the church. Is it okay if I come out and, and clean them? I said, is it okay? <laughs> of course it's okay. And I'll get you some gas. Whatever you want to do, you, of course you can do that. But you think about that. Sometimes we think that what we do is minimal. We, but it's not. You see, people say, oh, if I just had a decent job, you know, I, I would... I could do more. I would work harder. If I, could get, if I could just get married, I'd be sexually pure. If I could live in a better house, I would take better care of it. See, with this attitude, we are trying to reverse the faithfulness equation. You can't say, God, give me an abundance and I'll manage it well. No, he's going to look at what he's given you. He's going to ask you, how are you managing what, you, what, he, what you, he's given you? You know, all my life, uh, I've tithed. I was talking to an 84-year-old lady yesterday. I was over fixing her washing machine. It's something I do in my retirement and, uh, you know, help widows out if I can. And she doesn't have family here and doesn't have much money. And so I, I was laying under there, and, and, and I got down, and she says, well, let me pay you for the part. And I said, no. I said, that, that's just going to be part of my tithe. And she says, tithe? She said, what's that? Oh boy, I, it's great when you someone asks a pastor what's a tithe. You know, like okay, you know. So I said, well, let me tell you about what a tithe is. You know, and, I, and I didn't go over a whole sermon. I just said that's ten percent of whatever God has given you. You know, it's not just tithing your money; it's tithing your your life, your, your abilities, everything that you have. And all my life, I've tithed uh, of my resources. And I remember as a kid, and I, I'm old enough that back. When I was a kid, I lived in a little town called Indian Town, Florida, and uh, before I moved to the big town of West Palm Beach when I was in sixth grade, and we, we had pop bottles, and you could get two cents a piece for them when you turned them in for a deposit. Pretty good way. You didn't have to you know, mess up the environment with the plastics we do today. But uh, So I would take my bike with my, my baskets on the back of it, and I would go through all the ditches, the drainage districts, ditches as people would not bother their two cents and I would collect those and 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 I would come back in you know and I'd wash them up a little bit and I would bring them back to the store and, and I could make a two, you know a couple dollars three dollars or so I mean it was a lot of pop bottles and uh, so I had my eye on something at the store and it was a Zebco 202 reel because I like to fish okay I've always liked to fish now Zebco 202 is the littlest one cheapest one you can still buy it today okay and uh, it's not two, it's not three dollars, okay. <laughs> I think it's about fifteen dollars. But uh, uh, as I was uh, ready to go buy that, my dad says, and, he, and my dad was a, a good Christian man. He says, "Well, son, have you set aside your tithe?" I said, "My tithe?" He said, "Yeah, you know, ten percent of that—that's thirty cents. It goes to the Lord, goes to the church." And uh, I said, "Oh man, now we're gonna have two dollars and seventy cents. I'm not gonna be able to buy that real." So I got to go out and earn some more money, you know, so I can't get it till next week, you know. But you see, that is something ingrained in my life. So all of my life, you know, God has blessed me because I've tithed. I've given over and above to building programs in both churches that I served after seminary. And I want you to know that I have never regretted that. I've never regretted that. You know, so the Bible says, if you're faithful in a few things, I'll give you more. So, what about your opportunities? Are you squandering your opportunities? Even if your opportunity isn't as visible as others, should you squander your chance to serve the Lord? You know, a lot of you are serving the Lord in obscurity. That's okay. <laughs> Hands off to you folks that go to the nursery and take care of the kids and, you know, and, 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 no one ever thanks you for that a lot of times. Hands off for you, the praise band, it comes in here early, three services, you know, and, and, and is there to practice and rehearse and, and do some rehearsing at home. Hands off to those who get everything ready, maybe help clean the church. Whatever you do, whatever, however you serve, whatever you know, way that you serve the Lord, whether it's preparing a devotional thought to prepare people for the message, as Rodney does, whatever you do, you're doing it for the glory of God. 
so you can be sure that when you're faithful, you're going to open the door to greater opportunities in your life. Now, I've got to hurry up because I don't want to go over time. You know, when I was in seminary in North Carolina, I served a church there, and uh, they were kind of gentlemen farmers in the church. They all had other jobs in the bigger cities of Raleigh and, and Durham, but they had uh, all had crops of tobacco and so on that they that they they had. And when that time came, when Wednesday came, although I had 80 people or so on Sunday morning. And when Wednesday came, they didn't come to Wednesday night prayer meeting. And uh, sometimes I'd have only one or two show up. And I got thinking about that. I was being faithful with what God had given me to whom he'd given it to. And I shared the devotional. I shared the teaching of the word with that one or two. And later on, God began to bless me and bless our church and you know, we grew to about 800 people or so, you know, and I'm thinking, God, you know, is it because I'm any different than I was? And I'm any more talented than I was? No. God was opening the door for more faithfulness in my life, for more opportunities. You know, and I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back because nothing was of me. Nothing was of me. He said in verse 21, you've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. So it doesn't work the other way around. It doesn't work the other way, way around. My son, uh, David, I, I, I won't go into a long detail, but he had several jobs. He didn't go to college. He wasn't my college graduate. My older son was, and he serves in ministry. He's a worship leader in Fort Pierce at a church there. And... Uh, but my younger son, he tried a little bit of everything. He, you know, he, paramedics, he worked for a door company, he worked for a, uh, he, he worked, uh, for a cruise ship and putting in fiber optic cables and all that. So finally, a neighbor gave me an opportunity. He says, you know, he said, uh, if you sell your son to come to me, I'll, I'll give him a good recommendation to work for Lockheed. And I said, okay. So he started cleaning toilets and cutting the yard. Okay, eight years later, he's more than tripled his income, and God has given him the job that he always hoped to have, and that's hanging the satellites in the rockets. You know, and so, but he was faithful in those smaller things. I'm proud of him. I'm proud of my boys. I'm proud of, you know, all my grandchildren. Let me show you my grand. No, no, we won't go there. But uh, second of all, very quickly, do your best with what you've got, even when no one is looking. Or key phrase, verse 15, then he went on his journey. In other words, when the master went away, he didn't micromanage over what was happening. If, if someone has to stand over you the whole time, you know, then that's not being faithful. I don't know about you, but when your kids were younger, you're like, oh, did you clean your room? Well, yeah, all you know. No, clean your room means you pick up your clothes and put your toys and, you know, you have to stand over them. And sometimes you might manage a, an office or whatever, and, and you've got people that just won't do their job unless you kind of have to kind of micromanage them all the time. Well, this guy, he went away. He said, I'm going to leave it to you. H. Jackson Brown said, our character is what we do when we think no one is looking. Our character is what we do when we think no one is looking. Now, it's easy to act Christian at church, isn't it? We come to church, hey, brother, how you doing? I'm doing great. Have you a good week? Yeah, I had a great week, you know. And, and then you could have just yelled at your wife on the way to church, you know. You could have just screamed at your kids, you know. Are you get out of the house? Let's go. You know, you know, you know, you know you come to church. God loves you. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy to be Christian in the folks. But when it comes to the world and the nitty-gritty, when people do you wrong and all those things, you know, it's hard to be a believer. And that's where you have to rely upon the fruit of the Spirit in your life. So your greatest strides in the quality of faithfulness will be made when you don't have an audience. You need an accountability structure in your life. Someone to hold you accountable. In other words, how's it going? How's it going in your prayer life? How's it going in your daily Bible reading? You know, and, and when you've been married 49 years like I have, um, you, uh, you're, every time I get a, a text order, my wife says, who was that? <laughs> and every time she gets a text, I say, who was that? <laughs> 
So, you know, we, we're in each other's business. That's who we are. We're, we're two become one flesh, you know, and, and we hold each other accountable. So we have to have checks and balances. But no amount of accountability can overcome a lack of character. No amount of accountability can overcome a lack of character. There'll be times in your life when the master, so to speak, is on the journey. And you may feel like he's never coming back and you've got to work with this little amount and he's not as much as everybody else. And who's going to notice whether you invest it or you bury it? What difference will it make? I want you to know it makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. What you do when no one else is looking is where you build the foundation of faithfulness. Everybody has a favorite actor, right? Yell out your favorite actor. Uh, we, Reese Witherspoon, I heard. Somebody just maybe saw that movie Maverick with Tom Cruise. That might be your favorite actor. I mean, for you ways, he's still good looking, you know. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, I mean, so when you think about that, I mean, actors, you know, if they're really good actors, they study their craft. They work hard at it day in and day out. They go to courses. They go, I have a friend that, uh, that is an actor. He now is no longer acting as much as he did, but now he... Uh, is having an actor school, and he does it by Zoom most of the time. And, uh, but he crafted his abilities, and he did that when no one else was watching. And if you want to cultivate the quality of your faithfulness, you'll do it without an audience, do your best even when no one is looking. And the third way to cultivate your faithfulness is to make it a daily endeavor, even when you can't predict the outcome of your efforts. You see, the servants who are given the talents didn't know the outcome. Anybody ever made a bad investment? All right. I've been watching the stock market lately. I go, oh my goodness, you know. My retirement fund is you know, I don't like that, you know. And uh, there was a risk. They had to take it. You know, the, the guy with the five bags of silver, he could have lost it. He could have went out and bought, you know, a bunch of sheep and, you know, and, and they could all died. Some kind of disease by the time the master got back. And then he'd come back and say, well, master, you're, I bought some sheep and they all died. And what, what would the master done? He could have worried about that. It, it could have it had cost him to be what the one with the one bag of silver did. But he didn't do that. And I, I'm not trying to promote myself when I say this, but, you know, about 20 years ago, our church was growing to the point where we had four services every weekend and no parking. And I was preaching three different messages, <laughs> four different services. And so three and a half years we did that, and we had no parking. And so we, we developed this long-range planning team, and we said, well, and so we prayed about it, we thought about it, and one day I was driving by this property, and it had some for sale sign, and it was about a mile from our current facility, and it was 17 acres. And, and I said, well, maybe we should think about buying that property and relocate our campus. Now, this was a church that was over 100 years old at the time, Okay. Uh, one of the oldest churches of Broward County, 1889, it was founded. Now, they had never been in debt, okay? They didn't believe in debt. The previous pastor who died before me, you know, he uh, you know, they taught the church not to be in debt. So we came back with this recommendation that we relocate and buy this property that was listed at a million dollars. God gave it to us at 700000 And then we built the facility for $3.5 million. So we had about four and a half million dollars into this. And I remember we got them, our folks were gracious and they, and they gave a million dollars over and above in three years. And one lady even sold her house, bought a smaller house and gave the difference of a hundred thousand dollars. Still remember that. Wow. You know, as a pastor, all of us, you know, we've learned to give and give and give and over and above our regular offerings talking about equal sacrifice, not equal gift. And, and I thought about our first mortgage payment. It came in. It was $20,000. I'm going, whoa. And I look back at that. I'm going, how in the world did I have enough faith to lead the church to do that? I remember in a business meeting in, in, on a Wednesday night, we presented the long-range plan. It wasn't just relocation. It was a lot, on a lot of things. And uh, it was like 97, 98% voted to relocate. And I look back at that. How did I have the ability to do that? It wasn't me because it was God. 
could I do that again? I don't know. If God led me to do it, I could do it. But you see, that's the risk you take with using your abilities and your talents and what God has given you in your hand to do what he wants you to do. Success is never guaranteed. Understand that. Success is never guaranteed. Steve was talking last night about sharing a testimony. Well, if you ever shared your testimony, that's the greatest way to ever witness because no one can ever say, after you tell them about how Christ came into your life, they can't say, uh-uh, because it happened to you. And so you, if you haven't developed your testimony in about a minute and a half or so, you need to do that because then you can share your testimony. You don't even have to have a bunch of scripture. You can say, this is what God did for me. So we think about that. We always think about, well, what if it doesn't work? What if I share my faith and they laugh at me? They're not laughing at you. They're laughing at God. Keep doing what God asks you to do. Keep preaching the word. You know, keep doing what God wants you to do. Keep sharing Jesus. Keep serving the Lord. You know, and oftentimes it's not the fear of failure that holds us back. It's the fear of futility. Do you know what the NFL quarterback does? You know what he does? He has a backup quarterback. Any of you football fans here? Yes? Okay. Okay. He prepares each week, the backup quarterback prepares each week as though he is the one to start. He studies all the videos. He, he looks at the playbook. He, he sees what all is happening. And he never knows when his chance will come. And when it comes, he has to be ready. You remember, you that are football fans, remember Nick Foles? Super Bowl winning quarterback Nick Foles was a backup quarterback for the Eagles in 2017. And Carl Carson Wentz was injured late in the season. Many thought his injury put an end to any chance that the Eagles had at ever winning a championship. But Foles had been faithful in his commitment to prepare, and he was ready for the challenge, and he led the team to a Super Bowl victory. Same can be said of an understudy at Broadway. That understudy comes to all the rehearsals, you know, Sings all the songs in the background, prepares just like his, that he or she's going to be the star of the show. But they know that if the chance comes, if that main performer develops laryngitis or gets sick with COVID or whatever, they have to step up. Here's what I'm saying. You don't always know the outcome of your efforts. You don't always know the outcome of your efforts. You could write a book, but who knows if anyone will read it. It's a risk. You can start a business. But you'll never know if it'll be a success. But it's a risk worth taking. Look at this. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And that's why Paul said, Therefore, dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So I'm going to tell you something. If you want your life to stand out, hold out your hand. And ask God, what have you given me? And I'm going to be faithful with what God has given me. Will you be faithful to him? Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you teach us to live the long haul. You teach us, Lord, to do what is necessary. You teach us, Lord, to be faithful in every opportunity and every gift. Father, I thank you for your grace and for your love. I thank you for your love and your encouragement in our lives. Father, I pray if anyone here doesn't know Jesus as Savior, that this would be a day in which Christ becomes their Lord. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'll be sitting down.